nature by ralph waldo emerson chapter eight prospects in inquiries respecting the laws of the world and the frame of things the highest reason is always the truest that which seems faintly possible it is so refined is often faint and dim because it is deepest seated in the mind among the eternal verities empirical science is apt to cloud the sight and by the very knowledge of functions and processes to bereave the student of the manly contemplation of the whole the savant becomes unpoetic but the best-read naturalist who lends an entire and devout attention to truth will see that there remains much to learn of his relation to the world and that it is not to be learned by any addition or subtraction or other comparison of known quantities but is arrived at by untaught sallies of the spirit by a continual self-recovery and by entire humility he will perceive that there are far more excellent qualities in the student than preciseness and infallibility that a guess is often more fruitful than an indisputable affirmation and that a dream may let us deeper into the secret of nature than a hundred concerted experiments for the problems to be solved are precisely those which the physiologist and the naturalist omit to state it is not so pertinent to man to know all the individuals of the animal kingdom as it is to know whence and where to is this tyrannizing unity in his constitution which evermore separates and classifies things endeavouring to reduce the most diverse to one form when i behold a rich landscape it is less to my purpose to recite correctly the order and superposition of the strata than to know why all thought of multitude is lost in a tranquil sense of unity i cannot greatly honour minuteness in details so long as there is no hint to explain the relation between things and thoughts no ray upon the metaphysics of conchology of botany of the arts to show the relation of the forms of flowers shells animals architecture to the mind and build science upon ideas in a cabinet of natural history we become sensible of a certain occult recognition and sympathy in regard to the most unwieldy and eccentric forms of beast fish and insect the american who has been confined in his own country to the sight of buildings designed after foreign models is surprised on entering york minster or st peter's at rome by the feeling that these structures are imitations also faint copies of an invisible archetype nor has science sufficient humanity so long as the naturalist overlooks that wonderful congruity which subsists between man and the world of which he is lord not because he is the most subtle inhabitant but because he is its head and heart and finds something of himself in every great and small thing in every mountain stratum in every new law of colour fact of astronomy or atmospheric influence which observation or analysis lay open a perception of this mystery inspires the muse of george herbert the beautiful psalmist of the seventeenth century the following lines are part of his little poem on man man is all symmetry full of proportions one limb to another and to all the world besides each part may call the farthest brother for head with foot hath private amity and both with moons and tides nothing hath got so far but man hath caught and kept it as his prey his eyes dismount the highest star he is in little all the sphere herbs gladly cure our flesh because that they find their acquaintance there for us the winds do blow the earth doth rest heaven move and fountains flow nothing we see but means our good as our delight or as our treasure the whole is either our cupboard of food or cabinet of pleasure the stars have us to bed night draws the curtain which the sun withdraws music and light attend our head all things unto our flesh are kind in their descent and being to our mind in their ascent and cause more servants wait on man than he'll take notice of 
in every path he treads down that which doth befriend him when sickness makes him pale and wan o mighty love man is one world and hath another to attend him the perception of this class of truths makes the attraction which draws men to science but the end is lost sight of in attention to the means in view of this half sight of science we accept the sentence of plato that poetry comes nearer to vital truth than history every surmise and vaticination of the mind is entitled to a certain respect and we learn to prefer imperfect theories and sentences which contain glimpses of truth to digested systems which have no one valuable suggestion a wise writer will feel that the ends of study and composition are best answered by announcing undiscovered regions of thought and so communicating through hope new activity to the torpid spirit i shall therefore conclude this essay with some traditions of man and nature which a certain poet sang to me and which as they have always been in the world and perhaps reappear to every bard may be both history and prophecy the foundations of man are not in matter but in spirit but the element of spirit is eternity to it therefore the longest series of events the oldest chronologies are young and recent in the cycle of the universal man from whom the known individuals proceed centuries are points and all history is but the epoch of one degradation we distrust and deny inwardly our sympathy with nature we own and disown our relation to it by turns we are like nebuchadnezzar dethroned bereft of reason and eating grass like an ox but who can set limits to the remedial force of spirit a man is a god in ruins when men are innocent life shall be longer and pass into the immortal as gently as we awake from dreams now the world would be insane and rabid if these disorganizations should last for hundreds of years it is kept in check by death and infancy infancy is the perpetual messiah which comes into the arms of fallen men and pleads with them to return to paradise man is the dwarf of himself once he was permeated and dissolved by spirit he filled nature with his overflowing currents out from him sprang the sun and moon from man the sun from woman the moon the laws of his mind the periods of his actions externize themselves into day and night into the year and the seasons but having made for himself this huge shell his waters retired he no longer fills the veins and veinlets he is shrunk to a drop he sees that the structure still fits him but fits him colossally say rather once it fitted him now it corresponds to him from far and on high he adores timidly his own work now is man the follower of the sun and woman the follower of the moon yet sometimes he starts in his slumber and wonders at himself and his house and muses strangely at the resemblance betwixt him and it he perceives that if his law is still paramount if still he have elemental power if his word is sterling yet in nature it is not conscious power it is not inferior but superior to his will it is instinct thus my orphic poet sang at present man applies to nature but half his force he works on the world with his understanding alone he lives in it and masters it by a penny wisdom and he that works most in it is but a half man and whilst his arms are strong and his digestion good his mind is imbruted and he is a selfish savage his relation to nature his power over it is through the understanding as by manure the economic use of fire wind water and the mariner's needle steam coal chemical agriculture the repairs of the human body by the dentist and the surgeon this is such a resumption of power as if a banished king should buy his territories inch by inch instead of vaulting at once into his throne meantime in the thick darkness there are not wanting gleams of a better light 
occasional examples of the action of man upon nature with his entire force with reason as well as understanding such examples are the traditions of miracles in the earliest antiquity of all nations the history of jesus christ the achievements of a principle as in religious and political revolutions and in the abolition of the slave trade the miracles of enthusiasm as those reported of swedenborg hohenlohe and the shakers many obscure and yet contested facts now arranged under the name of animal magnetism prayer eloquence self-healing and the wisdom of children these are examples of reason's momentary grasp of the sceptre the exertions of a power which exists not in time or space but an instantaneous in-streaming causing power the difference between the actual and the ideal force of man is happily figured by the schoolman in saying that the knowledge of man is an evening knowledge vespertina cognitio but that of god is a morning knowledge matutina cognitio the problem of restoring to the world original and eternal beauty is solved by the redemption of the soul the ruin or the blank that we see when we look at nature is in our own eye the axis of vision is not coincident with the axis of things and so they appear not transparent but opaque the reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself he cannot be a naturalist until he satisfies all the demands of the spirit love is as much its demand as perception indeed neither can be perfect without the other in the uttermost meaning of the words thought is devout and devotion is thought deep calls unto deep but in actual life the marriage is not celebrated there are innocent men who worship god after the tradition of their fathers but their sense of duty has not yet extended to the use of all their faculties and there are patient naturalists but they freeze their subject under the wintry light of the understanding is not prayer also a study of truth a sally of the soul into the unfound infinite no man ever prayed heartily without learning something but when a faithful thinker resolute to detach every object from personal relations and see it in the light of thought shall at the same time kindle science with the fire of the holiest affections then will god go forth anew into the creation it will not need when the mind is prepared for study to search for objects the invariable mark of wisdom is to see the miraculous in the common what is a day what is a year what is summer what is woman what is a child what is sleep to our blindness these things seem unaffecting we make fables to hide the baldness of the fact and conform it as we say to the higher law of the mind but when the fact is seen under the light of an idea the gaudy fable fades and shrivels we behold the real higher law to the wise therefore a fact is true poetry and the most beautiful of fables these wonders are brought to our own door you also are a man man and woman and their social life poverty labor sleep fear fortune are known to you learn that none of these things is superficial but that each phenomenon has its roots in the faculties and affections of the mind whilst the abstract question occupies your intellect nature brings it in the concrete to be solved by your hands it were a wise inquiry for the closet to compare point by point especially at remarkable crises in life our daily history with the rise and progress of ideas in the mind so shall we come to look at the world with new eyes it shall answer the endless inquiry of the intellect what is truth and of the affections what is good by yielding itself passive to the educated will then shall come to pass what my poet said nature is not fixed but fluid spirit alters moulds makes it the immobility or bruteness of nature is the absence of spirit to pure spirit it is fluid it is volatile it is obedient every spirit builds itself a house 
and beyond its house a world, and beyond its world a heaven. Know, then, that the world exists for you, for you is the phenomenon perfect. What we are, that only can we see. All that Adam had, all that Caesar could, you have and can do. Adam called his house heaven and earth. Caesar called his house Rome. You, perhaps, call yours a cobbler's trade, a hundred acres of ploughed land, or a scholar's garret. Yet line for line and point for point, your dominion is as great as theirs, though without fine names. Build, therefore, your own world. As fast as you conform your life to the pure idea in your mind, that will unfold its great proportions. A correspondent revolution in things will attend the influx of the spirit. So fast will disagreeable appearances, swine, spiders, snakes, pests, madhouses, prisons, enemies, vanish. They are temporary and shall be no more seen. The sordor and filths of nature, the sun shall dry up and the wind exhale, as when the summer comes from the south, the snowbanks melt and the face of the earth becomes green before it, so shall the advancing spirit create its ornaments along its path, and carry with it the beauty it visits and the song which enchants it. It shall draw beautiful faces, warm hearts, wise discourse, and heroic acts around its way, until evil is no more seen. The kingdom of man over nature, which cometh not with observation, a dominion such as now is beyond his dream of God, he shall enter without more wonder than the blind man feels who is gradually restored to perfect sight.